CBA Day. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, this edition. I will begin our 2022 edition of the CBA Day. I'm Amabili Silva, Investor Relations at CBA, and I'll be with you throughout this morning. It's always an honor to meet with you and to be with you in this event that's so special for everyone at CBA. Before we begin our schedule, I'd like to instruct you that if you need, this auditorium has an emergency exit at the back of the room, as you can see. And now, getting back to our event, this time CBA Day is being organized in a hybrid format. So besides you here in the room, we also have a virtual audience. It's important to highlight that everyone's participation during the event is extremely important. If you are watching the event online, you can uh, send your questions through the chat, and this will be our main communication channel. And for those of you that are present during the Q&A, just raise your hand and our event team will take you the microphone. Throughout this um, session, we'll have many different panels with special guests that will bring in relevant topics to reflect on and discuss. Market trends in the aluminum industry with our special guest, portfolio for CBA and deep diving and recycling, innovation and digital transformation in the sector, and we'll end with Q&A. And to start off, we're going to watch a video that brings in a summary of everything that's going on ever since the IPO, an important milestone for CBA. Soon after, our CEO, Ricardo Carvalho, will present a bit of our strategy and the CBA evolution in the past year. Evolution of CBA after the IPO. We were the first company in the aluminum industry to have our shares traded at B3. Timeline 2021. In July, we began uh, trading our shares in the Novo Mercado with the highest standard of governance at B3. In August, we signed the contract for the acquisition of the wind power plants of Ventus de Santo Anselmo and Ventus de Santo Isidoro. In October, we signed the contract to internalize asset management for self-generation. Then we launched the Heflada project with a selection of areas for reforestation and planting over 13,000 trees in the pilot project. In November, we signed the contract for the acquisition of Alex do Brasil, entering the segment with the Alloys. And we had our first CBA day for investors as well, and we launched our pot room at Metalex with the 15,000 ton capacity. We started participating in COP26 on climate change. In December, we adhered to TCFD on climate change. In February, we had the acquisition of Alex, and we began managing our energy and power assets at CBA with the creation of our board for the energy business. We also launched the Primora brand for the Transform segment. In April, we had our follow-on, improving the company's liquidity. We also were awarded as the Personality of the Year in the mining sector. In May, we had the approval of our targets for the reduction of emissions by the science-based targets, and we adhered to the net zero ambition movement. We also launched our digital movement, and in June, we had recognition as one of the best ESG players in the mining and steelwork segment. In July, we were awarded by Moto Honda Manaus in the diamond category, and we also had our CBA dialogues on ESG agendas for 2030, with Ricardo Carvalho representing us um, at the Global Compound in the UN. We had the sale of the Neco uh, refinery in São Miguel Paulista, and we received the Amcham Brazil 2022 award for sustainability practices. In August, we issued our first carbon credit in the Sahadu region. And in September, we restarted our Prop Room 3 in line with our growth strategy for CBA, with Ricardo Carvalho representing CBA at the UN. We had the Projeto Real with the deployment approved and a hiring phase, and the disposal of dry waste with civil construction starting up in 2024. We also had the modernizing work uh, for our pot rooms in the next years, and we're very proud of all these achievements after one year of our IPO. Together, we'll continue in this success journey. CBA.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your presence today. Uh, both you who are here physically with over 100 people as well uh, watching us remotely. It's a great honor for us to be here and have this additional CBA day with all of you here. I'm going to start off talking about what you just saw in our video with the main achievements that we had ever since the IPO and how these achievements are all connected with our strategy. We're going to talk about this a bit, uh, reinforcing what was already showed in our video. So on this first slide here, uh, I'm going to stand over here so I don't get in the way of your view. On the first slide, at the center, we have our purpose, our uh, solutions that transform lives, and our four pillars of our strategy that I'm going to talk to you about as well. So on the top, you can see what our main ambition is and our culture and values on the left side that really guide us towards a, a direction of these ambitions following our strategy that you can see in these four pillars. Moving on to the next slide, we'll start off with the uh, acceleration of growth on the left side of the slide. And we had the acquisition of Alex do Brasil within our strategy for the growth uh, in recycling especially for um, secondary alloys. This was a successful acquisition with the integration with CBA was significant and very successful. Alex now seems to be part of CBA for a lot longer than it actually is when it comes to integration and our work methods and safety and other elements. It's, it was already a very well-structured operation and we had excellent integration work, very successful. As promised as well, in the IPO, we had the resuming of uh, the pot room three. So we anticipated this actually before what was promised in the IPO, and it's already under operation. Increasing the capacity at Metalex with the installation of our sidewall uh, pot room, which increases by 15,000 tons the annual capacity at Metalex. And that's another recycling unit as well. And moving on to the right side, you have the a pillar of strengthening our competitive advantage. Our competitive advantage has always been a focus of the company's management, especially in the commodities market. And despite all of the cost inflation we've noticed around the world, and especially in the aluminum industry, with such a relevant uh, cost inflation, CPA continues to be in the first quartile of costs, which demonstrates the robustness of everything we've always uh, discussed when it comes to integration and supply chain with uh, the generation of our own energy as well. These modernization projects have, that we've promised during the IPO have all been approved and under execution. Uh, the greenhouse gas emission inventories for 2021 that were certified externally demonstrated a emission of 2.56 in the pot rooms, uh, tons of CO2 per ton of aluminum, uh, compared to a worldwide average of above 12. So we're like five times lower than the worldwide average when it comes to carbon emissions uh, in the smelter phase. And also recognition that we received from some customers and the overall market, such as the example with Honda, Marco Polo, uh, that Varela will also talk about up ahead. Moving on to the next slide. Here on the left side, we have the pillar of potentializing innovation and partnerships. And we established a very important partnership with Gerdau to leverage uh, the raising of um, scraps, aluminum scraps. As you know, Gerdau has many centers for collection of scraps. Um, and we have this partnership so that we can have an important starting point uh, with more leverage working together with Gardao to be able to generate more scraps for our production process. So this is a very important partnership with Gardao in line with our strategy for growth and recycling. We also had the digital uh, movement that Varela will get into more details about. We were already working on the evolution of this with innovation and digital, but this year we really had a deep diving process to accelerate and uh, generate other opportunities in this field. We also advanced in the Real uh, project, which works really well in English and Portuguese. And uh, this is for recycling as well. We're going to get into more details up ahead, as well as new developments that we have underway with this pillar of partnerships, such as support for electric vehicle batteries, um, different sheets, uh, aluminum sheets and uh, lithium ions, uh, aluminum powder also, 
for uh, additional manufacture processes. And on the right side, you have the consolidation of our position as a reference in ESG. We adhere to the net zero ambition movement uh, along with the TCFD. And we also had recognition from the market, as you saw in the video, uh, by AmCham, an important highlight for sustainability due to our biomass boiler in our refinery. And also by Izamia ESG as one of the champions in the uh, steel and metalwork categories. And I'm also part of the Global Compound, and we had the honor to be together with this uh, Brazilian representation in the UN talking about ESG. It was a full day um, uh, of activities there and also was a spokesperson for uh, SDG 17, we had our first um, issuance of a carbon credit in the Sahel region. So the Red Plus already exists in the um, Amazon region, but we were able to develop the Red Plus for the Sahel bioma, which did not exist before. So we had a lot of technologies and developments that had to be made to be able to uh, have the Red Plus uh, certificate. So any landlords that have the right to deforest their uh, properties for farming or other purposes have now the option to not deforest or um and still have some credit, some carbon credits. So you can preserve areas that would normally be degraded. And we had some important advances also and more women representing leadership positions. And last CBAD, we had 17%, now we have 20%, sorry, 21%, sorry. And uh, we're not going to be able to keep the same rate in the future, but we're really in the, in the correct trend or direction uh, to fulfill our goals. And for the past two years, we've also been influencing our overall supply chain when it comes to ESG, which is really in line with our uh, sustainable supply goals. And this year, we will already be certifying 100% of our strategic suppliers. And we started to really work with this in practical terms after structuring the sustainable supply uh, work as well, which is an important ambition also to influence the supply chain and really be an example in ESG. So now I'm going to pass the floor back to Amabili to continue with our agenda. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's always great to see some advances and these important pillars. And moving on, we're going to move on to the trends in the aluminum market panel. And to give you some repercussions on this topic, we have a special guest uh, directly from London. And I would like to invite Edgardo Gelsomeno, the head of research at Aluminum uh, from Wood Mackenzie. He'll be with us online. And I want to remind you all that after the presentation, we'll have Q&A so you can prepare your questions. Thank you very much. Um, good morning for those in Brazil. It's uh, a little bit of uh, early afternoon for me here in London. And uh, first of all, a big thank you to CBA to allow me to be here today. And uh, I will be presenting the uh, Wood Mackenzie views on the uh, aluminum market. And uh, without further ado, I will just share my screen and start with um, with my, my slides. Hopefully you, you can see my screen now. I prepare a, a number of slides to put a frame on, on the discussion. The idea is that we generate enough um, discussions and interest to, to, to end the day with, with or this session with a good idea where um, the aluminum industry stands and um, generate as much um, as, as many questions as possible. My presentation will be divided in two sections. The first section is an overview of the market, which is the main section where I will discuss the main driving forces for the prices, uh, the fundamentals of the industry, uh, price forecasts. And then the second section is more about the medium term where um, I bring the, the, um, uh, the attention to the areas of growth for aluminum in the a framework of energy transition. And then at the end, we'll have enough time to uh, make questions. Beth, I can see a, a bar at the top. Uh, I, I hope, hopefully you see the, the entire screen. 
Uh, the best uh, way I thought to start the discussion on aluminium was to present where commodities are. This is this is um, the price evolution from January uh, this year for all base metals in the aluminium um, LME complex. I deleted um, nickel because it was off range, <laughs> but um, the majority of the base metals are presented here in an index form with the beginning of the year being 100. And what you can see here is that uh, most of the metals, all the metals really lost about 20% of their value since the beginning of the year. And the other thing that you can see here is that aluminum was the best performer for pretty much Q1 and most of Q2 before it started to, to, lose, to lose ground. Um, and, and now it's one of the worst uh, performance since the beginning of the year. Now, the one thing that this chart tells us is that the entire LME complex was affected by, by, by the situations in, in, in the markets uh, in 2022, basically external, external sources. But aluminum was particularly hit after the second the second quarter because um, the the uh, reliance on, on on construction and transportation which make up more, more than 50 percent of the of aluminium consumption and there are a number of reasons that led these sectors to underperform but particularly interest rates inflation leading to interest rate rises and this affects all, all demand of products or, or, or sectors that rely on, on financing. And um, moving, moving, I said before, external factors. So I, I selected here two, in fact, three, but um, I will talk about the third one in my next slide. And um, these external factors are pretty much driving the markets, not only the markets for commodities or metals, all the markets are being affected one way or another by, by, this, by these factors. Inflation is one of them. Inflation, inflation um, started to, to grow before even uh, 2022. And, and in 2022, we had two, two periods where, where, where everything actually uh, 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 Got worse when when the um, the with the invasion of Ukraine. But before that, there were already inflation forces or inflation expectations related to the amount of money that the governments put into the markets during the the lockdowns or the the the, the, the worst of the pandemic. Um, everybody expected that somebody would have to pay for that, that, that would have to come back as, as, as inflation um, for printing money to support um, support um, that, uh, that period. Um, but really uh, this year, uh, so what we, what we had is an, an, an improvement in demand at, at the beginning that, that uh, helped aluminum to, to outperform other metals, but also, um, so what we had is a, is a, is a, a supply constraint that supply couldn't really match the surge in demand, post-pandemic demand. And we had a lot of uh, uh, supply bottlenecks and, and, and logistic bottlenecks that increased prices. So all these were inflation, inflation, um, inflation resources, um, to put it in, in that way. But then we have the energy crisis as well. We have gas prices started to, to escalate, especially in Europe. And then the war in, the war in Ukraine uh, really generated this, took everything to the next level. Energy, the energy crisis became, became global, but with the epicenter in, in Europe, the most, you know, everybody knows uh, how bad the situation is in Europe and how much uncertainty we have at the moment here in this part of the world in terms of um, not only prices, the, 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 the gas price, for example, increased by 10, tenfold um, over the year, uh, but also um, uh, when this is going to, to normalize and, and, and nobody really expects anything to become um, 
um, normal again for, for at least two years. Then obviously uh, inflation forces central banks to act and the way they act is by, by tightening monetary policy, increasing interest rates. And we have, for example, the Federal Reserve that is um, clear that they have the objective to bring back inflation to 2% or the, 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 the long-term average, average or, or goal. And that is clearly having an impact on, on, on GDP. One thing I wanted to mention about these numbers here, these charts, is that they look very optimistic now. But this is, I thought it was in, in, interesting to, to, to show them because this is what McKenzie forecast from just over a month ago. But things change very, very rapidly. And this is pretty much what is driving today markets, ex expectations and, and, and risks. And this is uh, causing investors to move to safer, safer positions. And, and all this is having an impact in commodities. But I will go back to, to that. GDP is another important factor on, on the, on the um, uh, uh, performance of the markets. And everybody or, or most, Analysts were expecting global growth of 4.5% back in December, December 2021. Now the same, the same forecasts are below 3%. And for many, for many developed economies, the forecasts are negative for a number of months or quarters. So the picture is quite grim. All these obviously is spoken markets and they are reviewing all their positions moving away from commodities. So this is one of the reasons external factors affecting the uh, LME complex. Another factor is the US dollar. Normally, we associate the value of the US dollar with, with gold. There's a, an inverse relationship that most people always intuitively think of. But the value of the US dollar also affects industrial commodities. And the conduit for this is through cost. Although I would argue that this is not probably the main reason today, but this, this is the way that traditionally was seen. Higher, a strong US dollar means that for all producers, say aluminum or metals in general, or commodities, producers located in non-US dollar regions, the cost of produ production will fall and therefore less cost pressure prices go down. But today's, today's uh, events I think are, are slightly different. It's more about um, people or investors repositioning in favor of dollars as, 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 as a, as a, as a um, a safe haven, if you want to put it that way. Now, I said investors, and this is important because the, the catalyst for all those market sentiment or market views into the metal prices, in this case, aluminum, are pretty much driven by how the positions in the, in the LME pan out. The LME, as, as you know, is, 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 is the price is, the, is, is based on supply and demand of contracts. Therefore, uh, what investors do is matters. And this chart is particularly important. If you look at, for example, the, the two areas, by the way, are the positions of uh, funds. So this doesn't include consumers or producers that they will use the LME as a hedge. This is pretty much investors. It's only the positions of investors. Therefore, we can have a good idea of wh what are they, um, how are they having an impact on the, on the metal price. From May, if we put an LME price here, the line that we have here is the net position. So the light blue would be the, the long positions that they have and the dark blue at the bottom is the, the short positions and the line is the net position. 
from May 2020, the funds started to become more positive and increase their long positions and 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 upload short positions, increasing their net position or taking that to a positive level. All this period here, the aluminium price was going up. So if you put a, a price chart overlapping, you will notice that the aluminium price starts to grow from about May 2020. Then it becomes, um, it gets strong all this period where the net position is, is positive. And in this period from May, when you see that the positions are started to become less and less uh, long and, and become more neutral, the LME price started to fall. Now, now, a couple of weeks ago, or last week actually, for the first time we had net funds position being negative. So this is telling you what the investment investment um, um, uh, uh, industries is, is, is looking at. They are actually bearish in aluminum. They, they have a lot of uh, fears. And the fears they have is the fears of recession. So they, they, they are looking at one part of the equation. We as analysts, we need to bring more transparency. There are, there are a lot more to it. There's a lot more to it. One thing that I think is very important to note, and probably investors are not yet looking at it, is that the aluminum supply is quite fragile at the moment. For instance, the cost curve is actually uh, cutting the, the cost curve, or the price is cutting the cost curve. At, depends where you measure it, because today the price was a bit better, but when when it, it reached like 2100 the 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 price cut the curve at around um the uh, basically leaving more than half of the industry losing money and in the past in every situation where we had this we saw production cutbacks this is an average of the year so the average of the year is obviously is affected by what the price was in q1 but at the moment the price is actually touching the 50th centile. So I would say we need to watch this because the industry is actually, uh, profitability is quite quite um, quite compromised at the moment. There is still, there is a still a premium umbrella that is, is uh, 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 helping some producers to navigate this, this, this section. Here I'm presenting two cost curve. One is the C1, which is, which is the one that drives those numbers that I just mentioned. But the other one at the bottom has a net premium, has a negative value. And that changes to 33% uh, of, of, of smelters actually losing money. In, uh, today is even less because of the, the, the price is higher. But one thing that we need to consider is that premia are coming down. So the market, the market is already, um, uh, uh, discounting lower premiums. You, you can see in the negotiations that are, are taking place now that the Japanese is under 100 apparently. Um, and this is part of the smelter revenue. So if the aluminum prices is, is coming down and the premium that still at high level, which is offering a lot of uh, um, relief to the industry, start to, to erode, um, we have a situation where we, we will see more cutbacks. So this is something that I wanted to highlight because at the moment, the market is focused on the risk of uh, demand destruction. And also when you look at the global fundamentals, the fundamentals are pretty, pretty decent. In 2022, we have a, a small deficit pretty much in, in, in the rest of the world uh, or, or the world is China. Uh, China is, is, is very violent this year, but this is a deficit that comes from another deficit that we had in 2021. We have a lot of restocking taking place, which is also affecting prices. And it's, it's a situation where 
the stocking exacerbate the 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 the, um, the downturn. People see that there is metal available because people are stocking, and, and even uh, we have reports of consumers selling metal uh, or stocks, meaning that uh, there is a false um, feeling of abundance of metal. The reality is that the markets are are are, are quite balanced. But when you restock, at some point you need to, sorry, when you destock, reduce your stock, at some point you have to replenish those stocks. And, and that will come somewhere in 2023 and 2024. So there are areas where we see a positive, a positive um, uh, outcome. Um, the focus, yes, is today on the, on the demand structure. So talking about prices then, we have a, a, um, a long-term price forecast here. This is Wood Mackenzie current price forecast before taking into consideration any any um, uh, implications from from energy transition. And then what we have here, I will I will leave all the historical elements. Uh, for one side for the moment, and I will focus on these two uh, segments here towards the end. So we have a risk recession now that is driving prices down, and we acknowledge that. We expect that the prices next year will be, will be lower than this year. Our forecast at the moment is 2,300 average. And, but from going forward, there is, there is a supply issue that is to be solved. First of all, we have the energy costs that are not going to subside and are leaving a lot of production, particularly in Europe, vulnerable, the US, India, um, through coal prices, China. There is, there is a lot of um, uh, cost inflation and there is, there is an increase in demand coming from, from, from um, Economies returning to to some kind of normality in the next few years that will struggle to to have a match on the supply side. With that in mind, Wood Mackenzie forecasts a recovery in prices in the in the second half of this decade. So this is this is um, from today it looks like a positive a positive um, or, or or an optimistic forecast. I would say that when you bring supply and demand situation together, this is a very, very reasonable outcome. And in fact, um, and this brings me to the second part of my presentation. Um, I don't know how I'm with them. I think I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I will go very quickly with this because we would like to have enough time for, for discussions, but. This is a, this represents the growth areas for aluminium in an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a frame of um, energy transition. If the world is going toward the achievement of 1.5 degrees global warming, uh, the, the implications for metals are, are enormous and there are metals that are clear, clear winners on this, but aluminum is one of those. In particular, on the EVs, um, the, 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 the transition from internal combustion engine vehicles to, 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 to EVs, and the support grid for the electrification in general. All that will result in a big increase in aluminum. Remember, this is not in our base case. This is in addition. So we are looking at, I said, 11 million tons by 2020, and it's something like 20 million tons by 2040. And um, you can, you can uh, extrapolate those numbers also for primary, because that's total. And if we are not going to achieve that 1.5% degree scenario, anything in between will still be significant for, for aluminum demand. So there is a demand expectation here that 
is not even considered yet in the numbers, that is a supply risk. Because all these numbers, as I'm saying here, 10 million, 6 million, um, primarily or most of them outside of China, it's very, very difficult to think where we can find areas of the world that can support a new aluminum capacity and in particular new low carbon aluminum capacity. Because the days of building an aluminum smelter next to a coal mine are gone. Although there are some projects still on the pipeline in, in, in Southeast Asia and, and in India. But in general, going forward, that will be more and more difficult to finance and, and, and to justify. So when you see that that way, you have a huge supply gap here. And I see, I can see really, uh, this is really a, a, a positive uh, factor. Well, positive, what I'm trying to say is the bullish factor for the aluminum industry. Yes, today we are in a, in a very, very bad place because there's a lot of uncertainty. Prices are going down, investors are running away, but there is an unresolved supply issue that it will come back. And investors will see that eventually, and that will determine their positions in the LMA going forward. And then finally, the other element that I wanted to highlight without going into too much in, in details into, into, into numbers here is that part of that energy transition and decarbonization of the aluminum industry, scrap and, 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 and um, um, circular economies are key because aluminum is, is a green metal because it's recyclable. That's the main, the main reason why aluminum is, is a green. If you, you need to produce it in a green way, and one of the things that you also need to do is to need to be good at, at um, recycling, collecting um, aluminum after end of life and recycling it and bringing back into the supply chain. We are already aggressive in our base case analysis in how much scrap is going to be needed, but on a 1.5% scenario, that is even higher. So the message here is that there is a supply issue brewing that the markets at the moment are not seeing. And there is also the need to bring scrap. This is not, this is not, it's not solved yet because um, the scrap industry needs to improve quite a lot in, in order to achieve these goals need to be better at collecting, at sorting. We're still not there. And also, a lot of companies now are increasing the amount of scrap that they are using in their processes, meaning that there is also pressure on uh, uh, scrap availability. So it, it, each company that has access to green sources of power and access to scrap sources, and they have scrap um, ability to process, process scrap will be an advantage and will be in a good place on the next set, second part of this decade. So these are these are some, some things that I, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically there is demand from power generation uh, applications into, into different, different areas of the of, um, uh, aluminum demand. But from the price point of view, in order to, I, I will go back to this slide. In, in order to bring back, to, to, to incentivize this kind of supply, 17% by 2050 on, on the top of what we have now, you will need a, enough price incentive for the industry to, to bring this, this capacity. So the prices that we saw in my previous slides going to 3,000, 2,500 are in this scenario looks very, very conservative because it's not going to be enough to, to bring new capacity. And I think with that, I will, I will probably leave it. Um, I can go through those takeaways. We can go to, to questions, but uh, in general, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to say is that at the moment there is a focus for markets to just 
center on the demand destruction and the risk of, of, of recession. There's little consideration on the supply issues that are still unresolved. There is also a case for aluminum in the medium term that, that um, is also unresolved from the supply side. And then scrap, scrap, we still need to get better at it if we, we are going to, to uh, achieve all those goals towards the, the energy transition. And I will leave it here. I um, and I think we can we can we can probably have um, we have good time for questions uh, that you may have or areas that you would like to to uh, areas of concern or areas of interest that you would like to to expand. Excellent, Eduardo. May. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone was anxious for this moment in the presentation. I will begin our Q&A. And I want to once again invite Ricardo Carvalho, our CEO at CBA, as well as Luciano Alves to join us for this part of the event. If you do have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll take you the microphone. And for those of you that are online, you may submit your questions through the chat. Now we have our first question from Isabella Vasconcelos, Bradesco BBI. Please, Isabella. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Hi. Uh, I have a question still on, on the um, outlook for 2023, especially um, and taking into account your uh, price estimates, I think of 2300 for next year how you're looking at uh, the magnitude or potential magnitude of capacity shutdowns, uh, because it seems that uh, the industry will still be, you know, cash negative or around 50% of the industry would still be cash negative. Uh, so I'm curious to see how you're incorporating um, additional capacity shutdowns uh, for next year. Thank you. Thanks for, for the question. Well, it's, 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 it's a very, very important point. Uh, thank you very much. We, we still see more cutbacks coming, in particular in Europe. In Europe, we have another half a million tons of vulnerable production. This matters in Germany, for example, at the moment they're running with, with hedges. Um, when those hedges expire, it will be very, very difficult to, to replicate them. So that makes them vulnerable. Um, uh, talum, um, we have a number of smelters in, 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 in Europe that, that are, are at risk, smelters in North America. There is, there is still risk of supply. And this is what I was trying to, to emphasize that uh, there is a supply issue coming. Uh, at the moment, the markets are not looking into that. And um, it's, it, it, everything is very, very much focused on the demand destruction. Now, we don't expect demand to be that good in 2023, but we also expect supply to be uh, fragile. In that context is that we forecast a price of around 2,300. And that obviously um, is a price that will uh, take the industry to historical kind of levels of where, where the price that's the cost curve in the 90th centile. There's always an, a 10% marginal production that operates for many other reasons, or perhaps because they have, they have hedges or, or, or they produce by other products. But in general, um, that is consistent with our, our view. I don't know if I answered your question properly, I did. Thank you, Edgar, for your part answer, and thank you, Isabella, for your question. We have one more question coming. Now we have Pedro Grimaldi and Caio Grenner from BTG Pactual. Would you rather I speak English or Portuguese? Uh, I'm going to do it in English then, so it's better to understand. But uh, 
on your presentation, Edgar, I think you, you focused a lot on price declines, uh, thinking about how investor sentiment is towards aluminum, right? You, you showed the dollar, uh, the dollar index, you show uh, how investors are positioned in, in aluminum in the LME, but, but the point here is that actually the, the demand environment actually got a lot worse uh, from the beginning of the year until now. Uh, so what, what I wanted to understand is how did your, uh, your forecast for both 2022 and 2023 was altered uh, from the recent developments, right? Because now we're thinking about uh, a potential European crisis already uh, in 2022 uh, and into 2000, 2023, we're thinking about China, uh, which has uh, decreased its, its consumption on, on a relevant basis, thinking about what's happening with the property market, thinking about all the all the lockdowns that, that the country is going through. So I just want to understand uh, two points here. How did your supply demand uh, forecast, how did that, that, uh, that deficit that you showed for 2022 and the balance for 2023, how did it, how did it evolve over the, over the past few months? What was the main, uh, what were the main uh, alterations that you made to your model? Uh, where, where did it come from and what's the, the, the impacts that you can tell that you can tell us about what are your uh, your projections that you see uh, for these main uh, drivers for for Chinese consumption for property consumption uh, for European and developed economies consumption I think it's gonna it's gonna help us to better understand a little bit of, of what's uh, in your current uh, scenario that you're you're trying to project here thank you absolutely well we've been we've been downgrading consumption and throughout the year. China, at the beginning, we had, we had, we had uh, more, more um, positive um, forecasts, but as the government in China um, uh, was clear that they were prioritizing the zero tolerance to COVID uh, approach, it became evident that economy was relegated to a second priority. So we see a growth of less than 1% in China. And construction obviously is, is, is one, one of the big factors uh, that affects, affects um, demand. Uh, automotive is a bit better. There are a lot of incentives for the government to, well, incentive promoted by the government to revive that industry. Uh, Outside of China, we have also review down consumption in Europe, in the US, but there are sectors that are not that bad. Uh, we have, for example, the uh, packaging sector in the US still, still decent, same uh, in most uh, regions really. The construction uh, sector is, 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 is being hit and we expect that it's going to be affected because of the higher interest rates and the, the, the uh, cost, of, um, uh, cost of living in, in, in many parts of the world. So we've been downgrading demand, but also we downgraded supply. supply. One other thing on supply is that at the moment, a lot of the smelters benefit from premium that my my premium might come down, but also if demand comes down, smelters will probably start to produce less valuable products and more ingot, which also affects the profitability because the, the net back from ingot will be will be smaller. And if they don't cut down production, we will see what we saw in the past as well that some smelters will not restart or realign pots when when they. Uh, reached the end of life. So there are ways where you see less production even when they are not announced. So to go back to your question, we've been downgrading demand. We, we are very aware of, of, of the, of the demand, demand risks, but we, we are also uh, looking at the supply side, meaning that on average what we are removing from one side is also being removed from the other side, hence the, the balanced markets or slight deficit. Thank you, Edgardo, and thank you, Caio, for that question. 
We have another question coming in now from Pedro Grimaldi here at the audience. He's from Itaú Assets. I do have any view on the LME and Russia issue, on the Russia metal issue, and if LMF forbids uh, the Russian material to go through their warehouses and to be traded, do you think, what do you think could happen? Will Western buyers follow LME? Will nothing happen because LME is very small considering the total? What is your view on the question? Well, um, let's put it the other way. The, the LME doesn't want to do that because um, the LME can't really go and put sanctions on Russia when governments don't. At the moment, the LME is accepting Russian metal because because there are no sanctions against Russian metal. And um, because the, so it's the other way around, because the, the consumers are, are self-sanctioning Russian metal. I've been to a couple of industry events in the past couple of months. And um, it's very, very clear that, that consumers don't want to, to take Russian metal. Only those contracts that are legacy contracts or contracts that are in place that needs to be honored, nothing new is, is actually being signed. Meaning that Russian or, or Rusal has this issue that you know um, they don't they don't really uh, they struggle to 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 sell their metal. Now they they let me as a as a response to what consumers are doing. They are not taking any decision. They place a consultation. They don't want to be seen as we are going to do this. We sanction Russia. What they are doing is what it makes sense. Says okay, let's do a consultation. There's a consultation period where they will ask people: Should we sanction? Should we sanction um, Russian metal? And I think Alcoa presented the letter just recently saying yes, they should be sanctioned be accepted in the LME. Because the risk is that if consumers don't accept the Russian metal, that metal is delivered to the LME. Now, the, the LME system works with the assumption that any metal that is delivered to the LME, the market of that resort, you could go and take a delivery of that metal if you want it. But if it's Russian metal and people you don't want it, then the LME fails to be a market of last resort. So this is serious for the LME. They, they need to be very careful here what they do. The risk is that if a lot of Russian metal, if only the Russian metal dominates the LME warehouses, then the deliverable default will be Russian metal. And this is what, what uh, markets are, are concerned because if that is the case, the the price will be at a discount because if the Russian metal is at discount, and when you get the the, the metal from the LME, it will be at a discount, distorting the the pricing mechanism. Not too dissimilar to what we saw during the 2013 2014 uh, warehouse saga, where most of the pricing took place outside the LME, hence the premium we risk a similar situation where the LME will be a discount price and the real price will be higher because people will say, okay, if the LME is this price, the Russian metal, a good Western delivery would be higher. And that would probably be uh, taken by the premium. That's something that could happen. Thank you, Gigardo. If anyone else in the audience has any questions, please do raise your hand and we'll take the mic to you. Well, if we do not have any other questions coming from our audience here, then I would like to thank once again Edgardo for his participation. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'd like to thank Ricardo's presence here in the audience. And Luciano, please stick around with us as we continue with our panels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edgardo. Now we're going to begin our third panel, where Luciana will talk about CBA's portfolio, growth plans, and a deep dive on recycling. 
Luciano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amabili. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your presence. I know most of you guys, we have day-to-day -day interactions, and I'm here really to talk about a bit of our portfolio and what we're looking at uh, in CBA as our business portfolio. Also, I would like to talk about our strategy and the recycling market. Why do we think about the portfolio? When we look at the CBA, we have four businesses, primary aluminum, transformed aluminum, energy, and recycling. They all have different characteristics, different ways to analyze this. We look at aluminum as aluminum, really, and, and energy, uh, considering uh, energy trading, really. But the way we face this is really interesting for you guys to understand. When we look at the portfolio, we have four different pillars that really help us assess the business. First, the natural strategy with a strategic fit in this business. Secondly, the issue with generating value, where you can create value for this portfolio. Of course, we always look at the risk and return, not only the return, but also the associated risk for that business. And if this business or this project makes this portfolio more or less resilient in the future, which is also so important. And of course, with the indicators and the ESG indicators, if this will guarantee sustainability in the business overall, and if it's going to be a perennial business during the next decade. So in CBA, we have a main business that's still a primary aluminum, and we have some other projects that we're going to discuss that will grow this volume even more with the start of our third pot room. But naturally, over although this is more of a commodity business, there's more returns, but there's higher risks because we're more exposed to volatility and LME. But it's interesting to see that when we had the analysis considering energy together with primary aluminum, you help balance out the risk return ratio. So having energy is not only interesting to have lower costs and be more competitive in your business and lower uh, carbon footprint if it's renewable energy, but it also improves the risk return profile of your portfolio, which is why we have this strategy of growing primary aluminum together with energy. And when we talk about recycling and transformed aluminum, these are two businesses that are more stable because you're going to buy metal, transform it, and sell metal. So you have more limited margins, but it also brings in returns that are sometimes lower, however, lower risks. When we look at the overall portfolio, um, adding more recycling or more transformed LME also helps a lot more uh, for the risk return balance. And that's why we do plan on growing. We have interesting growth in primary aluminum. And more towards the future, we may search for growth in recycling and transformed aluminum, considering this equation of a risk return, which is the first point. And the second point is that is in Brazil, we still have some opportunities that are very interesting for growth in other segments. So that's a bit of our bias. And that's why we think it's really important to talk to you about what we think about the future projects and growth in CBA. So this is our vision, as you already know. These are some of the projects we have disclosed to the market. Here you can have an updated vision on the CapEx. We always look at this. Uh, we showed you one vision in the IPO and then in our CBA day in the past. But now we see natural inflation. Of course, this would happen because when we disclose investments, they're considering the currency at that moment. So there's natural inflation. But for some cases, I'd say the inflation was actually pretty low. Maybe one case where the uh, inflation was a little higher was a project where we um, closed this throughout the year. In the beginning of the year, we had the equipment, then we had the currency impacts and the steel costs and stainless steel costs as well, which generated a lot of the cost on impacts. But generally speaking, it's a cost inflation that's expected considering the period we experienced and also what has been going on in the world. So there's over two billion in investments, almost two and a half billion have already been approved and under execution, which is a bit of what you kind of mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. And this is distributed between 22, 23 and 24. Besides all of this, naturally, we have other projects that uh, we also disclose, which is renewable energy, where we brought in a bit of this vision. So we have investments we can work on here, but we also have other alternatives that we're assessing and we're open to these other alternatives. One example is that we could work on a PPA and buy um, energy from the market with long-term contracts. We can also have investments partnering with um, energy project developers, as we've been doing at this moment, where we're going to have a project next year with Voto uh and the wind power area in the Northeast as well. And we can also work on 100% of the investments. We have a solar power project in Goyaz and Nikilanja under development. 
So we're looking at these three alternatives always, and there's pros and cons, and we're going to make decisions at the right moment. But we will have more investments in energy in the future to support our growth um, of aluminum, as I mentioned. In the Hondong project, ever since we've been talking about this, we didn't have many changes because it's a project that's still under development. We're at the... Uh, La, the, we're at the previous before last phase next year we're going to be in the last phase then next year we're going to have um, a, a more updated vision on the values and costs and we're going to disclose this of course and we really want to extract the most value from this project but we are also looking for partnerships to develop the project together and of course finally you have the M&As which are always important alternatives for growth and possibilities for CBA we looked at this actively in the market Alux was a great example. We had an acquisition uh, from the IPO until now, and there's others that could appear. But considering the current moment, we are not in a rush. So we have a lot to deliver in the business still. We're really focused on delivering these. And over time, we may see new um, opportunities coming in, and we're going to always look at what's best for CBA. Finally, in this first part, uh, when we talk about the strategy, I just want to remind you about the investment strategy. Uh, as I mentioned, of course, we do have these uncertainties in the short term, as Edgardo mentioned, but we cannot forget what this business represents. On the left side, you can see a bit of the vision uh, on the other points about the industry. It's an industry that changed. There is um, a supply and demand uh, profile. It's more balanced out, but more towards the long term. We have um, a tighter issue with the offer in China and the supply we have a diversification in different segments as well. And with this decarbonization, as Edgardo mentioned, we could have new applications, new demands that could bring in more volume for sales in the market. This um, current uh, energy crisis, of course, we expect that at some moment it will end, but it should leave a cost inflation. And part of this is perennial. Uh, so it could be that we're looking at costs for the future dropping, but there's an inflation that's here to stay just uh, with the inflation of CPI uh, products, we can already see this um, cost going up in the industry. And this, of course, pressures costs and prices. And prices should kind of keep up with this trend, of course, integrated players with CBA. And just a moment, we had technical issues. So we'll be less exposed to this volatility of the inputs since we are going to be producing the box, say, producing aluminum and generating energy, so we should have some kind of competitive advantage since we won't have exposure to this cost inflation. We do have exposure to some inflation, but it's lower than what you see in the average of the industry. Besides this, we also have another issue where eventually we could maybe have a premium considering our uh, low uh, carbon footprint or maybe even um, charges for someone that's higher carbon footprints. It's still not a reality. It's still an initial trend, but we're going to start feeling this in Europe in 2023. And we'll have a little more of a reflex on how this could impact the market dynamics. And there's a trend also that's more recent that's very interesting, which is this deglobalization or more of a regionalization of supply chains, which is interesting, first of all, because in our vision, Brazil is a really friendly geography. So, of course, if there is some kind of a shift in the supply chains or networks of some regions, Brazil could be a great interesting place for this to happen. And besides this, the fact that CBA is already integrated into the supply chain, if there is some inflation or if there is some impact on the fact that you're going to be starting to offer um, some inputs from other locations, CBA is, uh, of course, uh, less impacted or uh, more exempt. So this is kind of an industry perspective. On the right side, where you see the CPA side, uh, we have an asset that's very competitive in the first quarter of costs and emissions with low carbon um, emissions and footprint. We have growth in primary aluminum and in recycling. We're searching for more opportunities for growth as well. We're really well located in Brazil to operate where we're already in, but we have a cost base and logistics that's very favorable for the US or even for Europe if our products are well accepted. We already have a direct channel with the U.S. It's about 10% of our total sales uh, through exports to the U.S. But in the future, we have an interesting trend. We could possibly even be exporting more. And finally, the fact that we're in this supply chain allows us to capture uh, greater value in each phase of the supply chain from bauxite until transformed and recycled. Well, great. So now about CPA, I want to start going in a deeper dive into the recycling market and then Alexandre 
we'll talk about our recycling initiatives. So about the recycling market, Edgardo talked about this topic a lot. But the first point is, why is recycling so important for us? First, low carbon footprint. We show that recycled aluminum has a footprint that's a lot lower than all of the other energy sources. So aluminum produced in other energy sources actually ends up having a higher carbon footprint than recycling. So the renewable energies will have about 2.5, 2.6, as we can show you with the hydropower plants, but recycled aluminum is 0.6. So there's a demand coming from different segments. You can see transportation, construction, and electric power generation, where you have a benefit of having the aluminum used in these segments because you have reduction in light, uh, in lighter weight and reduction in energy consumption, but there's a demand for recycled uh, aluminum. We know that in uh, electric vehicles, you have more demand for recycled aluminum, uh, 40% more aluminum in an electric vehicle than a conventional vehicle. But besides this, you have a demand that's greater for recycled aluminum. This is also the case in civil construction, where you have a demand for uh, aluminum and an improvement in energy efficiency in the buildings, but also recycled al aluminum with greater scrap content. And when it comes to energy, not only with the electrification of the uh, grids and electric networks, but also with solar panels, and you also have more recycled aluminum. So together with all of these factors, um, this would not be enough on its own for a trend to really become a reality. But there's another point that's very important, which is the demand um, on the field. We have two factors that are very interesting. So first of all, uh, in the first phase in our supply chain, after our customers really demand greater amounts of recycled aluminum in the packaging market, as you can see, some examples, and also in the automotive market, as you can see, with the um, segment with other targets to reduce emissions that will naturally have to have more recycled aluminum content or uh, low carbon footprint aluminum. So there's a demand coming from our customers and our end customers. And there's also a strong demand where the customers of the customers or the end customers are a lot more conscious, more critical, and of course, interested in the impacts of the products they consume. And actually, they'll bring in a demand that is more uh, that is greater for this kind of product. So that's why it's so important to have our positioning in this segment and having a bigger amount of uh, volumes coming from recycled aluminum. And then within the reality of the aluminum market, this is the forecast we're bringing in from specialists um, and where we always consider uh, Wood and McKinsey's visions. But there's a stronger demand for recycled aluminum and we can see the demand of recycled aluminum is growing a lot more than primary, primary aluminum. It's about uh, half a percent per year. Recycled aluminum is about 3% uh, or more. And it leaves from uh, total recycled aluminum on average uh, about 25 and 30% of the demand to more than 40% in two decades. So we see that the growth is relatively gradual or stable. But why is that? Because it's not that simple to grow in recycled material. Why? Because first it's a cultural aspect. So you need to change the culture in a country to be able to incentivize recycling more. It's not something you're going to do from night to day. It takes time. It's a process. Brazil is quite well developed, but other regions are not yet. That's the first point. Second point, the life cycle of the product is long. So for an aluminum packaging, it's quite quick. You consume a product um, with aluminum and other materials in the equipment in the and equipment used for the packaging. But when you look at... Um, a vehicle or construction or a product that uh, are more like consumer goods, it's like decades until you can, from the moment where you sell the product and then till the moment it gets back as scrap. So naturally, you also have a gradual increment in the recycling process because of the availability of the scraps. The third factor is the technical aspects. Quite frequently, these scraps are contaminated, so they're mixed with um, other materials, paint, leather, um, and other uh, materials or plastic. So we have some investments that are being done in technology, but there's also some technical complexity to be able to have an adoption around the whole world. This takes a while. That's the first point. And also, it's a technical issue with alloy. Sometimes you have a certain alloy for a certain product, but when you look at that scrap from that product, you won't necessarily reach another product. You're going to have to mix that with um, ingots and correct the alloy. So there's a technical complexity, and that's why growth is limited in certain ways. And partially this is related to what Edgardo mentioned in his presentation, which is what limits a greater amount of recycling. 
So when we talk about Brazil on that side on the right uh, corner of the slide, Brazil is quite well developed. Uh, we already recycle about 99% of the aluminum cans consumed in Brazil. We have a really integrated supply chain, but we're also very strong with cans. And cans become cans. Considering the alloys you have, you can recycle that little can. It becomes a can again. But at CBA, we can use a very small part of cans because there's contents of, uh, from another alloys that are contaminants. But that's why it's a, almost a, a closed cycle in the can uh, market in Brazil. But although it is well developed, there is some opportunities for us to consider scraps that can be good for us with uh, profiles or uh, from scraps from automotive vehicles where you still have a potential to reach some level of uh, the use of the scraps in the market. As Ricardo mentioned, uh, you also have expected growth for us as well when it comes to uh, collection centers and other partnerships so that we can have greater volumes of recycling in our product mix. And finally, when we think about CBA and why it's so important for us, we have three pillars we're looking at. First, the recycling business and why this is so strategic for us. Well, first, because it's the natural profitability, so you have return on investments that's attractive. Uh, along with the mitigation or better balance in the risk return ratio in our portfolio. So we have uh, attractive returns and we also have a, ba a better balance in our portfolio of products. Of course, you have synergies with our operation. So I can not only capture the returns through the business itself, but I can also capture synergies in the operation. Second point, the carbon footprint, ESG naturally. And besides this, you have an important component which is a very informal supply chain. We know about this, but CBA, um, as we are operating, also has conditions to support better. And there's another social aspect involved, which makes a lot of sense. And we're very interested in uh, developing this. And finally, you have growth. So Edgardo mentioned that uh, we have this scope of uh, supply in the market, depending on each scenario. And there's this gap. Why? Because the intensity of capital in this industry is really high. Because to invest in new capacities for primary aluminum, it's real high investments. And that's why you have a difficult decision. And that's why you mentioned you need to have an incentive price to justify this decision. And it's not simple. So when we look at recycling, uh, this decision is a little easier because the intensity of the capital is lower. You can grow volumes and you can quickly occupy a market that you didn't have before. But of course, you have limited margins because you're buying scraps with uh, for a percentage of the LME. And this process, of course, you're selling to more of a premium LME. But even though you have more limited margins, the returns on investments are attractive because you have less investments. And generally, this could be a good alternative compared to um, having higher investments in primary aluminum, where we already have big investments in our portfolio. So it'd be interesting to diversify a bit more with more investments in recycling. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I'll get back soon to talk about more of this in the Q&A session. And of course, I'll be available now. I'm going to invite Alexandre Viana to talk to you about our projects and our recycling initiatives. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And the idea is to show you how we're going to invest in recycling and why. The, the first slide is really educational because it shows you where the recycling comes from, from the aluminum industry. At the center of the slide, you can see the CBA factory, and you can also see our own uh, scraps generated in our own internal process. And then we have our products that move on to our customers, which are all industries that process these. They also generate another type of scrap, which is the industrial external scrap, and finally, you have the final consumer, which at the end of the cycle, uh, as uh, Luciano mentioned, also generates scraps uh, post-consumption. So the scraps industrially and the industrial external scraps from the customers are a situation that's pretty much well equated because there's no contaminants. So we basically recycle 100% of our internal scraps and what our customers provide we close this cycle also recycling at CBA because part of customers' scraps, they can also recycle at their own factories. So the difficulty or the bottleneck is the scraps post-consumption, which naturally will come 
uh, from some demolition. So there's going to be sand. There's going to be screws. It could come from a car. It's going to have plastics and so on. So if we use this scrap um, in our process, first of all, we'll have technical issues because we won't be able to uh, reach the chemical composition we need. And secondly, we'll have another problem that's environmental because scraps that are painted generate uh, emissions, which are undesirable. So that's the main issue that we're equating. Our focus is in the post-consumption scraps. And then you can see what we're doing. So some of our main initiatives. So for uh, Metalex, Metalex, our main objective with this uh, recycling line, which was already mentioned, they're coming in now. We're going to make the content recycled grow a lot at Metalex. And that's how we'll be able to be a worldwide reference in CO2 emissions. Today, Metalex already does this with the billets when we use this most of the times with the CBA ingots that vary between one and a half to two when it comes to footprints. And it could even reach 1.4, which would be the worldwide reference. I was actually at a conference two weeks ago in Barcelona for aluminum, and it was a, a business meeting. And whenever we would sit down and discuss business with uh, billets, the first question was, everyone asked, what's your carbon footprint? That was the first question. So there's value in the industry. Synergies between the uh, operations and units at CBA, that's very interesting because some of the scraps, for example, that are generated at CBA today are being processed um, at Alux. So this synergy ends up generating an optimization in our portfolio. Uh, the way we operate in the secondary alloy market, Alux introduced us to the new market. Uh, and up until then, CBA did not work in this secondary alloy market where you are working basically in automotive uh, and auto parts markets. So secondary alloys, uh, which are used basically 90 or 95 percent of scraps and only 10 or 15 percent of pure metal. Uh, for example, at Metalex, we currently use this uh, 60 percent scraps and 40 percent pure metal. So it's a whole new market that ends up making us have the possibility to use scraps that are different than the ones we were using before at Metal X, for example. And it really opens up um, our scope when it comes to products and types of scraps that we buy. And with this, of course, you can also um, operate in a more significant way in the recycling market. So for the recycling line, Metalex and CBA, uh, in the next year, we're already going to uh, be inaugurating this recycling line. I'm going to talk about this in more details in the next slide. And we already have plans for uh, somewhere near the future where we can have another line that's very similar within CBA that could supply our lines at CBA for scraps. Uh, an increase in the recycling content and transformed products. That's another opportunity as well. So the transformation area now with the internal scraps that are 100% used in our process. A good amount of the scraps from customers are also transformed and used in our process. But now we have a whole new opportunity, which is using the scraps of the end customer. And with this, we can increase the level of recycled um, inputs in our products. And finally, we want to develop a structure to be able to capture the scraps because this is very fundamental so that we can really be a leader, a pioneer in recycling. We need to be working with the collection of this recycled material. So as Ricardo mentioned, partnerships with Gertau, for example, but there's also initiatives where we can start up uh, with our own collection centers and in this way have access to scraps at competitive prices. Over here, you can see some details about what the recycling line is at Metalex. Then after, I'll show you a video that gives you a little more technical details on what this recycling line will bring in. But some important highlights or messages is that it's going to be the biggest production plant in Latin America for processing scraps. It's uh, 100,000 
thousand tons in this line, and fifty thousand tons will be consumed at Metalex, and fifty thousand tons will be consumed at CBA or Alex. Secondly, it's state of the art technology, the best in class when it comes to treating scraps. Third point, it's going to be the capacity to be separating uh, metal, uh, phys physical uh, iron, and remove any kind of plastic, wood, or other residues and waste from civil construction. I'm going to show you how this will happen. And what this will provide is that, first of all, I want to remind you that at Metalex, we have a business model, which is where our customer captures the scraps and we process them at Metalex. At CBA, we're probably going to follow a model where we capture the scraps and sell the product. At Alex, we have a mix between both. And so accessing scraps with lower prices for us and for our customers. And the main diff you have different types of scraps. For then secondly, we're going to be able to receive loose scraps. Now we can only uh, receive pressed scraps. Uh, so we'll be able to start receiving loose uh, scraps. And it will have to be, um, it could be in bundles. And it'll generate more flexibility for customers that will be able to buy dirtier scraps, which means cheaper scraps, right? And they'll be able to process this at our unit. And with this, as a consequence, we'll have content that's recycled at Metalex uh, from 60 to 80%, which is very important. will be a worldwide reference. We have a carbon footprint that varies between 1.5 and, and 2. We're going to reach 1.4. Uh, we'll, we'll be using our ingots as a matrix at Metalex, which is what's already happening. And you have synergies and the possibility to process scraps at CBA and Metalex, which is something that we're searching for for quite a while. So we're going to show you a video now, and then I'll give you an idea about how this will happen, how the magic happens when it comes to technology, okay? This is the Metalex video. Now you'll see the plant, the recycling line. And we have this piece of land that also belongs to us. And I will show you what it will look like once we have our recycling line set up. So this is where you start the process. Over here, you have the hydraulic crane where you have the pressed uh, scraps, but it could also be loose uh, scraps. Then it goes into the shredder for scraps. Then you have a second shredder that will uh, shred it a little more. And finally, you have um, a drum magnetic separator and the eddy current, which is that system that separates the metal items from non-metal items. Then you have a dozing hopper. This is one of the processes in the recycling. It's gonna go into the bagging equipment so we can send it to other uh, plants, or it can go to the other side, which is the decoder to remove paints, greases, and oils. And then finally, it goes into our uh, furnace where we're gonna be doing the recycling, and then you have our filters. So this is how it's gonna work, and this is really the best in class when it comes to recycling in the world. We have European suppliers with equipment, and it's something that we're very proud of, and it's going to be happening from next year onwards. Finally, to talk about Alex, as Ricardo already mentioned uh, quite a bit, and Luciano did as well, Alex is our, our strong point there is premium alloys, and from this industry. So it's a secondary alloy market, 300,000 tons. Alex has about... 25 or 30,000 tons. But our focus here with Alex is premium alloys within this uh, secondary alloy segment. And what we call premium would be more elaborate alloys, like an alloy to be able to work with a, an engine or some alloy that is refined uh, and more complex. And of course, there's higher premiums. What's like a non elaborate um, alloy, like some deoxidating equipment or material for the steel industry. There's, it's really not sophisticated at all, and it's like a commoditized product, very low margins, and that's not very interesting for us. So through Alex, we have our customers that become Toyota, Honda, Renault, Yamaha, and with this, 
we have a entry door into a segment that we didn't have before. With synergies, considering commercial operations for our customers, most of our customers are at Alex, and they're also customers in the downstream segment. So there is a bit of synergy. And there's also what we already have designed, which is a expansion and modernization plan for Alex. Currently, there's a capacity for about 30,000 tons for manufacturing, and we have a plan that in the future, we'll be able to take it to over 4,050 ton tons, which would be the first step to advance into this market that is uh, basically 300,000 tons. And we have about 9% market share at the moment. So these are our plans in this side, which is the secondary alloys segment. And with this, I finish my presentation. I want to thank you all so much for your participation. Thank you so much. Great presentation, Alexandri. Um, thank you so much. And it's a great to see this plant for Metalex in details in our next panel. We're going to talk about digital transformation at CBA and what it means to be innovative in our market. And to present this topic, I want to invite Fernando Varela. He's our Transform uh, Product Director, Innovation and Digital Transformation Director. Varela, welcome. Thank you, Amabili. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be this at this event with you. Our main idea here is to show you this presentation in two sections. The first section is going to be all about the innovations we worked on at, in transformed goods, where I'm responsible. And in the second block, I'll be talking about our innovation culture and digital transformation culture, which is really connected to all of CBA in those four areas Luciano presented in the beginning. So moving on to the first block, Today, when it comes to transformed goods, the main innovation projects represent about 10% of our manufacturing revenue. And we uh, consider this in a, in a three-year horizon. It's a little shorter than the average in the market because our proposition is to accelerate projects and not only accounting for what we already have. We want to move quickly. And so that's why we presented in our previous CBA day what we do and how we innovate through startup design thinking models, canvas methodologies. That's not the goal to go over all of this once again, but our main focus is to demonstrate where we operate within this chain. So we're searching for synergies and partnerships with the possibility for co-creation with our customers, searching for opportunities of, uh, to bring value in all the segments, looking at this 360 degree environment. So together with customers, we search for improvements that could be a reduction of weight, better uh, carbon footprint, or an improvement in logistics, environmental improvements, or even social environmental uh, Im improvements. And based on all of this, we develop together with our customers. And that's where we see where our value proposition is, really meeting all of the needs in the supply chain. So that's the first step. And it's important to share this with you. And all of this is connected to our transformed goods strategy where we want to be relevant in the Americas for packaging, operating strongly in automotive transportation, operate with civil construction and other segments that we consider to be very important. So it's a bit of this that we're going to go over now and some cases as well that led us to bring this in as something relevant. Now we have approximately 90 initiatives and each one is connected to a special business division. So we have initiatives that are connected to electrification, uh, so battery foil uh, reduction in weight. We also have other initiatives connected to agribusiness. So based on all of these initiatives, we move on to a scope uh, of opportunities and options where we can start working with these different projects for innovation. So the first one is uh, really connected to uh, projects that can accelerate the use of aluminum in the automotive sector. So we've seen a strong reduction in weight. This started way back there with the different uh, sheets for the reduction of um, automotive uh, weight and then motors. 
and then more structural components. So we're participating in different solutions to uh, work on inputs and structural components for automotive sectors, where we really want to be a reference in the nationalization of some products. And why not also consider electrification, where we can also be an important rep that works beyond Brazil, especially when we talk about uh, battery for So we work with different solutions and these already represent part of our revenue. A second case is a case that is really symbolic and important, which was the starting point of some of our innovation projects, which is the composition of an, um, of an equipment for the ceiling of a bus for a customer that will actually show you a video with their uh, contributions on this project. So this was done together with Marco Polo and this initiative uh, involved our value proposition that was really focused on how we can bring this differentiation. So this differentiation is really related to not only uh, selling extruded materials or sheets, but really solutions. And these solutions have an important advantage. You can bring in greater loyalty, you can build together, it's difficult to copy, and you grow not only with your share in that customer, but also with your relationship between suppliers and customers. So throughout many, many years, we worked on different projects using design thinking and getting it wrong quite frequently. We had five different projects where we had to have like a pivot and then restart and redo them. But based on this, we were able to create the ceiling that is built um, at our DC in Caxias do Sul. So we have a service and solution center at the uh, production plant in Aluminio and another one in Caxias do Sul. Uh, we built this ceiling for the bus, we delivered to the customer and then they build this on top of the bus. This brings a lot of value, they can substitute another product, they can reduce the weight and for all of this, it's also representing greater proximity so we can extend this to other products. I would like to then uh, show you a video from our customer. Hi guys, great pleasure to participate in this event, uh, talking about a partner that's CBA, which is a supplier at Marco Polo for over 50 years. In the past years, uh, to be more precise, ever since 2016, we started an innovative project with CBA for our new generation of um, travel buses, Generation 8, which was launched in July 2021, and it's really been an absolute success in all markets. We've been working with CBA ever since 2016 with this new concept for a bus, uh, considering aluminum ceilings, to be able to substitute our uh, glass fiber ceiling, searching for a reduction in weight, more recyclable material, material that has mechanical properties that's better than fiber, uh, within this uh, sustainability journey. And we've had phenomenal work with CBA. We started off with the assembly of prototypes, initial concepts, co-creation and co-engineering jointly, which was one of the main success factors in this project, with total opening from all of the CBA team. And I'm really thankful to everyone here. This project brought in important, spectacular gains for our vehicle, a reduction of weight uh, over 30, 40% on the ceiling, and of course, it uses materials that are completely recyclable, such as aluminum, and substitutes uh, glass fiber, which generates waste in our process. This project that's so innovative, considering a hybrid union, uniting, um, gluing these different components with mechanical fixation and a cold clip process, it's extremely innovative, and it brought in gains for CBA and um, upsides for Marco Polo that were very significant. I'd like to thank everyone for the joint work and efforts, the obtained results leading to a reduction of over 30% of weight reduction, which is such an important factor when you consider vehicle consumption in the vehicle, recyclable material, level finishing, it's a lot higher than uh, glass fiber. So here at Marco Polo, we're extremely happy with the results achieved in this joint initiative. And of course, we would like to once again create more and more projects like this with CBA as they have been a major partner for us. Thank you so much and have a great event. So as we've seen, this project really brings in a very important value proposition for our customer, 
We started this production in the beginning of the year, working with um, only one type of vehicle, which is the double-decker bus. And we plan to extend this project now to all of the other types of buses at Marco Polo and also other markets. So it's one of our uh, value propositions on how we can add value in our supply chain. Moving on, in civil construction, when we use the same principle to add value to processes and products, we took on an important step for the transformed area, which is really entering civil construction, um, participating in solutions for systems with our uh, Primora brand. Here we have an example, and after our coffee break, we will be able to look at this. We have Andre, he's here as well, and he can teach us a little bit about how this works. But we start going beyond and uh, bringing this beyond civil construction with a value proposition where you can work with um, medium and high uh, level projects. So we kind of leave a bit of that zone with competition for cost and price. And we have more of an ambition towards a need uh, in the market to bring in something that's really unique and different. Uh, that's valued considering the quality of the products we have, our services and our deliverables and also our results with a product line that really provides a major differential for our customers' choices. And moving on, we also have another project that is extremely important because it's not only about the actual delivery and adding value, which is this proposition with our innovation area that always looks at higher margins than the products that were uh, existing before, but there's also an important proposition of really... Uh, working well with the product that can uh, supply some need. And so we have a solution and we're actually uh, awarded by a certificate in England with the solar storage. And this is a solution for aluminum for uh, solar power in Pantanal. So we created the solution that's practically like a kit that could be set up by the local population, the Riverside communities. And this kit provided um, electric power to 2,000 families. So besides the value proposition of adding something different in the segment, there's also another important social approach, which is something that really makes us very proud. Moving on, we also have the packaging sector, as I mentioned, one of the sectors that are extremely important, where we have a regional uh, performance, we work in the Americas between Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and the U.S. Within this market with the packaging, CBA represents one of the biggest producers of um, the sheets in the world. If we include China in thin sheets and extra thin sheets, we're among the third largest producer for uh, segments where we uh, operate in. A typical example is right here on your table. So this bottle of water has an uh, aluminum sheet, and this is a segment, right? Always uh, packages that are like multi-leveled and multi-layered packaging. We always have flexible um, pro packaging for other segments as well with cookies and chocolates and candies. And we are also a strong leader with value proposition that uh, represents a lot of quality and also an opportunity for growth in the segment. So we've been working with the development of solutions for markets out of Brazil, where the alloys, uh, the aluminum alloys are different than the ones used here. So we're developing this market, entering into some segments where you have a potential for growth. So we see uh, a potential for growth in the agribusiness, pet food as well. And we have sheets as well for applications for other packaging opportunities as well. So we've been developing these solutions that are closer to our customers so that we can be um, closer to them, not only in Brazil, but also in the regions we mentioned. And also looking at where the main trends are for migrating uh, so we can work together with associations and institutions and really develop other solutions. Along with all of this, we also have a recycling solution where, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we have this project that's the Real project which was a solution created by CBA. Uh, we have the patents for the solution, and throughout the years, it's become a reality. So we had a lot of tests done internally on the field and universities, and now we're at this phase where we're actually deploying the solution. It's a solution where 
actually, as Luciano mentioned in the beginning, when we take a look at aluminum cans, Brazil has 98% uh, recycling rate, and considering the value of the aluminum and the advantages as well that this can become uh, income for people, and these multi-layered packages don't have such a simple process. So that's why we're bringing in a bit of this uh, proposition to kind of simplify this task. And with this, we can increase the recycling rates and levels and, of course, bring in more income and value. So aluminum also has important advantages in the segment, which really bring in a higher shelf life, bringing in um, the perennial long-lasting capacity of the product, where you can guarantee its integrity. It also brings in all of the freshness and need uh, for greater uh, protection from an environmental perspective. So all of these are benefits that aluminum can provide that any other material would have a greater difficulty to provide uh, with the same kind of solution. So within this project, we would also like to highlight um, a contribution or comment from one of our customers, one of our biggest customers in this segment, and how we've been working together for this new project. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, at the CBA Day. My name is Marco Dorno. It's a great honor to be here with you today uh, to record this video representing Tetra Pak Brazil and over 1,500 employees. It's always um, something that makes us very happy to be with CBA, a strategic fundamental partner of ours that helps us so much every day to deliver our purpose and makes us, of course, better. And they've always contributed to our different initiatives in the company. I came here to tell you about a fundamental project that's very strategic for Tetra Pak, which is Real, the recycling aluminum. And before talking about it, I would like to give you some context on why it's fundamental for us. Tetra Pak is a leading company in this sector for processing and bottling of food and beverage. And we have our Longa Vida package or Long Life package, which is one of the most important businesses and it really is like this multi-layered package where you have the composition of plastic aluminum and paper at tetra pack we really like seeing uh considering the business we have and the markets we're in and at the moment we're in we always like saying that sustainability is not a strategic pillar sustainability is the strategy and we need to bring these sustainability aspects always into the core of our product and all of the different um activities we have that are complementary. And when we look at our strategy for sustainability, basically what we're talking about is the construction and deployment and insertion of our company into a circular economy with low carbon. When we look at Brazil and necessarily the different initiatives one, two, and three, considering the priorities, they're all connected to recycling. Tetra Pak Brazil started over 25 years ago with a process for the development of technology establishing uh, recycling partners, adding value to the post-consumption material and environmental awareness. Today, we already recycle over 100,000 tons per year for post-consumption material, obviously using the installed base of over 30 partners that recycle in Brazil. But we imagine that this is not enough on its own. We have major challenges in Brazil connected to a selective collection processes and environmental education. So that's why the recycling project for aluminum proposed by CBA is so um, so enthusiastically embraced by us at, at Tetra Pak Brazil. And it represents for us in the short, mid and long term, the capacity to exponentialize with our recycling uh, rates. And this will allow us to dedicate more time uh, to more volumes with the um, recycling plant. We believe that with, with this, we'll be able to add even more value to post-consumption material. And after this value added, we'll be able to distribute prosperity within the supply chain to the recyclers and all the recycling partners, but also generate additional incentives so we can search for more and more material that we can add to this plant. What I wanted to mention here is a non-negotiable commitment from our side to really make this production plant work well. Ever since the first day, we're completely interested in making this volume start off um, from the first day with its full capacity for production. And we really place and deposit in this production plan, in this format, a major part of our strategic plan to leverage recycling in Brazil. So once again, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. 
Thank you, CBA, for everything you guys do for us in our day-to-day -day operations. Count on us, and we hope you all have an excellent CBA day. Well, here, for us, the proposition goes way beyond just offering aluminum. Just as we've seen in the other initiatives for energy, transportation, and how we can connect better to customers and bring in a really interesting value proposition. So our value proposition here is besides improving the environment and providing a solution for recycling, improving income for people that really need this, you can connect to our customers and thus create more loyalty. We're solving a problem for customers, which are their packages and how we can improve the recycling rates. This, of course, increases our uh, relationship and this uh, made us have greater share in the sales all over Brazil and Argentina and now expanding to Mexico and the U.S. So our pro value proposition in innovation projects is really based on how we can expand our supply chain and relationship with all of our stakeholders. Moving on. Here, we uh, want to just pause quickly and show you uh, about this. Uh, we talked about what was this innovation work and some examples in the transformed goods. But now I'm going to show you another aspect, which is where I take on this other role in the company, which is related to all of CBA in the company, uh, which is really a culture of innovation and digital culture to be able to have digital transformation and how we can really have this long-term ambition to become a reference when it comes to digital transformation in the future. So all of this goes through a history. I'm not going to go over all of the details, but it's really important to mention some key messages and takeaways. Ever since the spinoff we had in 2016, we created a CBA culture, and within our culture, we started going through a project with a... Um, RTS, which was a reduction in cost and greater profitability. Within this project, we kind of already started working on innovation projects. Based on this, we uh, started evolving culturally, and this went through um, some provocations in the overall group about where we wanted to get to in the next 100 years. This was a, uh, something that provoked us to perform self-analysis and uh, assess our 4.0 industry and where we were headed and what we wanted to reach. Based on all of this, we did a bit of what we call the minimum uh, viable change. So each of the different areas and departments worked on some value proposition so that you could do something differently that could bring in uh, some innovation. So we made this uh, really become strong engagement in all of the organization. And based on all of this, we had many positive results achieved. I'm going to go over a few of these now uh, throughout this presentation. But as I mentioned, this also led to the fact that we noticed we were already mature enough to really create a process that could be a little more robust. And throughout this year, as Hikardo mentioned, we began our journey, which is actually something that started way back then, uh, more dedicated to this innovation office where uh, Amabili represents this uh, full-time office as well. And uh, the participation from other people in the company with, on specific projects that we call these box projects. And these spots uh, also lead us to create some career plans and propositions where we also use people's knowledge and skills. But we can also, at the same time, expose these people to other activities along with uh, their nonlinear careers. And I'm already part of a nonlinear career with two different roles. And through all of this, we can bring in elements that make us evolve even more. So this is a bit of our value proposition. And based on all of this, we also work on self-awareness uh, and uh, knowledge in the entire company leadership team with training, uh, alignment of expectations, where we're focused on reaching, what are the tools we're going to use, uh, we involve uh, in these projects 12 different initiatives with over 200 people involved. They've been working uh, with us in different projects, among which a few of these we plan to already put into practice and execute throughout the next year. And of course, we also plan to bring in greater profitability. So today in industry, we notice that the major differential 
uh, for competitive advantages, really going through digital transformation. But not only is it related to competitive gains, but also retention of talents, hiring new people, and really uh, focusing on where the world's headed. And so this is very important, and it's also really connected to uh, all of our HR department and how we can interconnect all of this within this new culture. So our culture promotes, besides innovation, uh, diversity, and to have innovation, you need to have diversity as well within this process. So basically, the best way to bring in ideas and generate opportunities is through different thoughts and mindsets. And that's why all of this becomes even more important and even more inclusive within our processes. So we're also bringing in a, a plan for maintenance and organization of this information, which becomes a database which can be used, of course, later on and disseminated within all of our organization. So here, just to show you some examples, I'm going to start off with the right side and then I'll move on to the left side of the slides. On the right side, you can see some different initiatives we've already worked on throughout this journey, which are very important. So we have uh, the augmented reality used for training, where we have training sessions, for example, for the maintenance and high voltage scenarios where you don't have to expose your operator to risks with accidents and they can train with this um, uh, firefighting training and other initiatives where you can keep the productivity in your factory and also improve and eliminate any kind of risks for accidents. In the second example, we have Rosie. She basically performs uh, this artificial intelligence solution, which allows for spot purchases in a quicker manner that's more intelligent, more automatic within this artificial intelligence process, where we plan to expand this uh, and take it on to other purchases as well, other values, and of course, within other companies in the Volta Engine Group using this concept as well so that we can use artificial intelligence in the same way and, of course, eliminate uh, higher bureaucracy projects and accelerate processes. And the third case is an award uh, that we received that was also very significant between the companies that are most innovative. And the process was that we had an acquisition of a production plant with a recovery uh, of oil and petroleum processes where we would have a lot of operational gains and environmental gains. But we performed this acquisition in the middle of the pandemic and we had to perform the commissioning through the pandemic period. So we had two processes because the production plant came from Germany. We'd either wait for the pandemic to stop or we would, together with suppliers, work on the deployment of all of this online. So our suppliers in Germany went through the entire process and they taught our team to commission the production plant. So it was an initial case. It actually became a product for the supplier. They're working on different commissioning processes remotely. And we had significant benefits where in the first year we were able to have the returns on this investment. And the last case I wanted to mention is within the pot rooms, we brought in artificial intelligence and we were able to have important operational gains. So productivity gains, consumption gains, and all of these made us uh, reach results in our production and productivity and our cost matrix really improve. And this, of course, became an important inspiration for us to be able to continue to grow in other areas in the company. So our focus is really connected to this, and we really plan to create work groups that can improve these operational areas even more. Now we're going to move on to the left side and what we saw within this office that we're working on ever since the beginning of the year is different initiatives and projects and how we can accelerate, uh, make quicker mistakes more frequently and really create this culture in our organization. So these are some examples um, that are in this directing plan of how we can use more vehicles, um, autonomous vehicles, to be able to uh, transport and handle scraps in the factory and other types of solutions as well as in our operations to avoid mistakes, human risks, and improving our productivity, 
So we're going to advance on this a lot with these initiatives and search for opportunities in the sector, as well as uh, digital maintenance, as I mentioned. So we're going to be working on bringing in opportunities that can help improve maintenance and that we can have uh, the results with better indicators in our units, being more and more competitive, avoiding these increases in costs and competitive gains. Uh, so finally, we also have uh, video analytics, which is a little bit of what Alisha mentioned before, where you would have um, a scraps uh, plant where you have different elements for separation. And he mentioned, if you remember correctly, that you have some scraps that are cheaper. You can have these mixed so uh, with other substances. So in the video analytics, we can identify what kind of scraps, what are the contents, and how we can even price it. Uh, in a better way and have better negotiations to avoid risks and contamination within our production plant. Basically, these are these examples I wanted to share with you today. I'm ending here, so I want to thank you all for this opportunity, and we'll, uh, I'll be here with my other colleagues for the Q&A as well. I want to invite Amabili back on, and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Excellent. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Varela. Thank you for the contributions also from our customers. It's great to see these success cases at CBA. Now we're going to begin our Q&A session on all of the content that was presented today. And I also want to remind you all that if you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll take you the microphone. For those of you that are participating remotely, please send your questions through the chat. We'll be very happy to answer all of them. We already have an initial question here from Caio. If you can take the microphone to him while we organize things up here. And for this session, I would like to once again invite all of the executives that presented today. Ricardo Carvalho, Luciano Alves, Alexandre Viana, and Fernando Varela. Thank you all. Caillou, you may proceed with your questions. Hi, guys. Good morning again. Thank you for the time presenting. And it really called my attention, uh, the part on recycling. So I'd like to explore this topic a little more. You did mention that uh, for quite a while that this is a business you want to grow in. It's a business that you see a lot of value in. There's reduced volatility, and it reduces a bit of the volatility for the primary section. There's low uh, carbon emissions, low capex per tons, and it's really in line with what you mentioned with the acquisitions you announced as well. And I think one comment that calls my attention is the fact that you would like to dilute this exposure in the primary segment that's a little more volatile through the recycling segment. And that calls my attention, right? So what's the dimension of this um, from your mindset? What would be considered a more adequate structure for CBA when it comes to volume in the future? Uh, how much of this would come from the recycling business and how much would come from the primary aluminum segments? We already had this conversation with the business of primary aluminum, and there is some kind of a gap. And so this will maybe not be as easy to um, work on due to maybe a, a lack of greater predictability from the market. And so maybe that's why you would follow... Uh, the recycling segment more. So I want to hear from you guys on how the structure would be. And I think a second question would also be in line with the same question, which is what would be the pathway for this? From a priority perspective, would these be new acquisitions with Alux? Or would this um, open up a whole universe that's greater where you can think about more organic expansions, uh, green fields, brown fields? And also I'd like to know if you already studied something in this direction, uh, any possible synergies, and if you have anything you could share with the overall economics in the project, 
and things that are maybe a little greater in the segment that you could share with us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caio. I can answer that one. Let's think about primary aluminum. And today we have a capacity of over 380,000 tons. That's going to move on to 430 in 2025. And then we'll have a full capacity uh, of, of primary aluminum. And uh, additional expansions in this segment, I believe, will depend on how the industry will evolve, right? New technologies coming in. There are different issues with the intensity of capital involved. So I'd say that for the period of time we're discussing in the next five years, we'd probably stop when it comes to liquid aluminum, but all the rest would come potentially through recycled aluminum. So at this moment, we currently produce or process about 130,000 tons of scrap. So you would add this amount and that could grow more. So maybe another 50,000 that would come from Metalex. Remember, there's a capacity for 100,000, but just an additional of 50,000 because these 50,000 I'm substituting uh, with scraps that I already have. So anyways, you have this um, product line for Methylex and you have a potential for new investments as well uh, with CBA where I can replicate what I've done at Alux, as Alishani mentioned. And you also have the possibility of bringing in more capacity through m and So I'd say that it's a little bit of everything. We are going to be doing this gradually. It's really going to depend on the market where there's uh, some knowledge and know-how here that we've been developing. And Alux brought in an acceleration to this process through Alux. We're going to expand our knowledge as well. But the volume is really uh, limited a lot more by our capacity to access the scraps uh, than just an issue that's technical or investment related. In practical terms, it's relatively simple to invest and operate with a recycling line, but it's a lot more complex to access scraps and guaranteeing that the scraps can get to you. So that's why our efforts are going to be more concentrated towards the collection and capturing of scraps and bringing this in-house. Because if I have this collection process, then I can add more capacity to process the scraps up ahead. So I'd say that the initial plan is to really uh, have a, a total volume, including this uh, over 600,000 scrap tons, adding up the uh, the recycling and um, primary aluminum, but it could be a lot more than this depending on the initiatives we see up ahead. Just to add on, in transformed goods, we uh, started using 100% of the internal scrap, so everything that's generated in our process is already recovered by the primary area. We also started this uh, process considering all the difficulties, uh, but also starting partnerships with our customers so that we can buy from our customers and then increase our content, uh, recycled goods, using the equipment in the primary act area as well. So we can have even more loyalty with the customers, increasing this purchase of uh, scraps and avoiding the use of primary metal. So maybe one last observation about where we can get to with Alex. Uh, we already have been working with Alex for quite a while and we know uh, where we're headed and what's the maximum we could reach considering the geographic space of 45,000 tons. But yes, we could have uh, replicas of Alex and other spots uh, around to expand this even more. Thank you, Caio, for that question. Our next question is from Isabella. Isabella, you may proceed. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about... Recycling as well, which is in line with the last question from Caillou. But as I understand a bit more about the economics uh, for recycling that you had mentioned and returns that are higher uh, than expected. So if you could maybe share a bit more about this and the differences of the capex per ton and also um, about cost reductions, as you mentioned. Uh, you, it would be less uh, carbon intensive, less energy intensive. But what's your expectations for cost reductions in all of these different projects you mentioned? So just to talk to you about the dynamics, Isabella. First of all, the capital intensive uh, aspect is a little lower. So probably $1,500 per ton when you consider um, recycling. It could be more or less depending on the characteristics of the location and the types of investments you need to work on. But generally speaking, for the overall market, it's probably around this amount. 
And for primary aluminum, we have a reference uh, in the last investments made in industry. We're at a level about $4,500 per ton. But I'd say that this does not consider the recent um, cost inflation because last investments were about 2018 or 2019. So it could even be more than this, but the last reference was this. But even this last reference is three times more. Once again, of course, uh, in primary aluminum, maybe you have more returns. Potentially, you can have more competitive costs. So the price and dynamics in the market uh, are really in uh, compensating this greater uh, capital investments. But the decision is not so simple. That's why Edgardo mentioned the issue with the supply gap that we could see up ahead, which is uh, due to this fact. It's not simple decision process. Uh, and there's also technology that's uh, potentially new coming in. So deciding on technology that could maybe not be the same up ahead. And it's not a challenge just for us, but for the overall industry. That's why I have very few projects in the pipeline. So imagining that this is the case, you have lower investments and uh, they're a lot more modular. So it's not uh, only lower, but you can do it slowly, gradually. So I'd say maybe these 50,000 would be a good module. It could be a little more, a little less, but it's a pretty good module. And you can um, add capacities as you have more growth in the demand but also as you have the collection processes of scraps, so which is another benefit as well. It's very important. And then the return rates, I'd say, uh, are basically, uh, in our vision, considering the synergies we can have with our operation, we can have a return rate that's even higher than if it were just um, an isolated business. So if I had um, a recycling business in an isolated way without CBA, I would maybe have returns with uh, double digits, low double digits, which is normally what you'd expect. But when you put this into CBA with uh, the synergies, probably like, uh, two high digits. So that's pretty much the, the, the volumes we're searching for. And it could even be more depending on how successful we are with the purchase of the scraps. So that's a key element. If you can access scraps that are cheap, you can have higher returns. And this is a point that's very important with the level of collection and the improvements you need to work on. And besides this, the line Alexander showed you about this for the separation of the scraps is really fundamental because based on this, I can buy scraps that have less quality, that are more contaminated. I can separate the contaminants. And with this, I can have higher profitability. So this line is the first step. It will already be very relevant for us, but eventually we can have other investments also that can take place in the future. And it's going to be modular. So as the market grows... There's the more needs. I can add more volume until I reach a limit in the collection process in Brazil. But I think we're very far from that. Great. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Does anyone else have any other questions? Just raise your hand and we'll take you the microphone. We have one question here from Leonardo from Bank of America. Thank you, guys. Just about this discussion here on the impact that this should have for the company as a whole. You mentioned there's a volume of 600,000 tons, including expansion with primaries as well, but uh, including recycling. And I wanted to understand a bit more about this in line with Isa's question about what we can expect as margins once we reach this volume. And then a second question is, if this expansion and this greater focus on recycled items and transformed items could somehow hinder or change the company's decision process with the expansion for, uh, regarding uh, primary goods and even the Hondon project. Well, thank you, Leonardo. The first point is that in our vision, uh, this, mo this volume I mentioned is, is the first step uh, and something that we're going to really implement based on this, of course. But naturally in the recycled goods uh, and also transformed goods, uh, in the downstream process, you have margins that are more stable, but they're also uh, kind of a little more locked in. You buy metal, you process the metal, and you resell it. Typically, in the transformed aluminum market, uh, you consider uh, 5 to 15% EBITDA, and the recycling maybe from 10 to 20% EBITDA, but it really depends on each market because depending on the market, if the scraps are already expensive for the producer, you have less margin. And when scraps comes in cheaper, you have higher margins. So in aluminum transformed items, um, the margins are a little less volatile. 
But basically, that's it. You have this margin, but it's guaranteed. It's more stable. When you put this in uh, to CBA, naturally, you'd bring in a business that has margins that are lower, but they're more stable. So we're looking at it a little differently. Instead of looking at how this will um, impact our average uh margins, we can see, look, we have this um, possibility for primary aluminum that's going to capture some important movements. And uh, when you have a peak in prices in the overall market that we can compensate this part with primary aluminum as it is today, we'll be able to capture it and bring in this EBITDA. And in our base, we also have more stable EBITDA that guarantees kind of a buffer. And this can grow as I increase my volume of recycled aluminum or transformed aluminum. And I can also have less volatility in my EBITDA. So our vision is a little different. Of course, from a percentage perspective, it really depends. Uh, we don't want to give a guidance, but it's really difficult to estimate a percentage value because it really depends on how the primary aluminum is going to be. And it depends on all the LME. But of course, uh, what's most important is that as you add, as you add Alux or more recycled volumes and more transformed volumes, I'm also adding more stability in the EBITDA. So as I evolve, I have a greater certainty that the EBITDA will have that value or delivery and less volatility uh, for that uh, EBITDA that's growing more and more. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for that question. Now we have a question coming from the chat online for Alexandre Viana. He would like to understand more about the installation and deployment of recycling lines at Metalex and about how this will impact the increase in production in the consolidated level because the energy uh, consumes ingots from other plants as well. So if you could talk about this a bit. Of course, first the uh, investments in Metalex really started off with the installation of that uh, pot, the sidewall uh, pot room. And this will only increase its capacity uh, with Metalex from uh, 65 to 90,000 tons. So you have 15,000 uh, tons additionally. And with this um, line in recycling, I'm going to increase the content of recycled goods in the products Metalex produces. When I increase this level of recycled uh, aspect inputs, I can use the primary metal for other products they can sell. So that's where you see an increase in production. Thank you very much, Alexandre. So a next question here from uh, for Fernando Varela. Could you talk about the connection between innovation and digital transformation with the ESG uh, footprint at CBA as well? Yes. So there are many different connections. First, aluminum has the advantage of already being connected with ESG. But it's important to mention also that all of the transformations we're working on bring on their own some kind of benefit. If the benefit uh, is consumption, you're also improving the ESG footprint. If the benefit is social, you're also um, impacting some of this ESG element. So we have targets and these have already been set by our environmental department. And we do plan to, together with these uh, projects for digital transformation, accelerate and leverage or potentialize all of this um, improvement in our indicators when it comes to governance. So when we're talking about the automation, for example, of this process, you're avoiding mistakes or errors in the procurement processes and you're improving governance as well. So when it comes to social, you have projects that can impact society overall. And environmentally, aluminum itself has all of the advantages uh, that aluminum provides and, of course, all the additional projects with greenhouse gas emission reduction. So there's an internal part, a procedural process, and also an external aspect connected to what we can do with customers in both areas. Great. Thank you very much, Varela. Well, if we do not have any other questions at this moment, we will officially... Uh, move towards the end of our event and I would like to thank you all for your questions in person and through uh, the chat and I want to thank you all for your participants as executives here during the presentation and in the Q&A session. I'm going to say goodbye here and I'll pass the floor on to Ricardo Carvalho for his final remarks. Thank you so much ladies and gentlemen for participating uh, in this event with us today, this morning, remotely or in person. We'll see you all in our next earnings call on November 8th, when we have the uh, closing of the market and our call will be on the 9th of November um, at 11 a.m. 
Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amabli. Once again, I want to thank you all for your presence today. Those in person and those remotely as well. We have over 120 people watching us online. I want to thank you all for your questions. They've been excellent. Uh, the content has been really uh, interesting to help us uh, share more information on what we're doing and what we're thinking about and how we're progressing in line with the promises in our IPO and our strategy and always focusing on providing more transparency and having more of an open relationship with all of you as investors and stakeholders generally. So I want to thank you all once again. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.